Well, welcome everybody to our second uh, of our copyright series this fall in 2016. This is Affordable Learning Georgia, and we are here with Ann Gilliland, who is from UNC Chapel Hill, and she is uh, quite the uh, quite the scholar on both using um, copyrighted materials in libraries and using them uh, within OER. So I'm very happy to have her with us today as she takes us through um, OER and its copyright and OER and Creative Commons. Uh, I'm going to pass over the presenter role to, to her and we will get started. Thank you very much. Oh, you just muted yourself. So I did. Well, yes. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, and uh, I'm so pleased to, to be here to talk about um, using materials in OERs. Um, and as uh, your moderator said, please feel free to uh, type questions in the chat or um, uh, unmute yourself and ask a question when you when you need to. Um, so one of the things that is um, Really, very interesting about. Um, oh, and just quickly before we get started, mm -hmm. uh, I think you need to share your desktop again. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Okay. okay. Yep, and we can go, see it. Okay, I'm going to go back into the, my slideshow. Yep, we can totally see that. Looking good now? Okay. Great. So, um, okay. So let me start over. Um, yeah, so uh, still glad to be here. One of the things that is really interesting about dealing with copyright is that um, it's a relatively new type of law um, in our society. Uh, the first Copyright Act was uh, in England in 1709. And so we have only for a few hundred years been thinking about how we deal with um, material and, and sort of things that are not things that we can touch, see, feel, but that we still uh, have a feeling of ownership over and uh, are things that we argue about. Um, and so I think that is the origin of a lot of our feeling our way through what copyright is, what copyright should be, and, and how we want to relate to each other with regard to copyright. Um, the U.S. Constitution provides for Congress to make copyright terms for a limited time for the uh, purpose of advancing science and the useful arts, which in the 18th century meant uh, literature, uh, inventions, all kinds of progress of different sorts. Um, the most recent thorough overhaul of the Copyright Act in our country was in 1976. Most of it took effect in, in 78 and then other parts of it in, in some following years after that. And that is kind of a key plot point for us because um, a lot of times one handles copyrighted materials depending on what part of the Copyright Act was in effect at the time the materials were either created or published. Um, and so <clears throat> we have some differences uh, that make a difference in our, the way we deal with a lot of material that was made it, done in the 20th century. Um, over the years, terms have lengthened a lot for copyright. Uh, the, the Constitution says that the terms must be for a limited time, but doesn't specify a length. 
Uh, the term started at 14 years, then there was a renewal for another 14 years. Um, today, terms start at 70 years plus the life of the author. So if I make a copyrighted work today, uh, that work will be in copyright from now until 70 years after I die. Uh, that has its good side and its bad side. It gives my heirs time to perhaps monetize my work. It also makes a lot of time where everyone can kind of forget about the work um, or the uh, authorship, we lose track of authorships and uh, that can be a big issue for us to deal with when we're trying to reuse older material. Uh, just as an FYI, copyright is mostly uh, most of the lawsuits in copyright are civil actions. A few are criminal, but, but very few. It's mostly a matter of a rights holder or alleged, you know, putative rights holder uh, bringing a lawsuit against a defendant. Um, copyright is also a strict li liability statute, which means that uh, your, your state of mind is not key to whether you have infringed or not. So, for example, Another strict liability statute that we all deal with are the traffic laws around speeding. If you are speeding, you are liable for speeding, perhaps. Um, it doesn't matter whether you knew you were speeding or not. Um, in, in copyright uh, litigation, you may be liable for damages if you've infringed, even if you had no intention of infringing. Uh, I make that sound a little scarier than it is in most cases, but uh, it is also something to keep in mind. Um, so what do you get when you um, are, are talking about copyright? What does it do for you? Uh, copyright is intended to protect creative expression. And the uh, magic formula is, from the statute, uh, pre protects creative expression when it's fixed in a tangible medium. So, for example, if I um, paint a picture, that, that, that picture, that painting is a creative expression, write down a story, record a song, all of those are examples of a tangible medium. Under today's copyright law, uh, you can also write to disk, and that can be the tangible medium if you are uh, writing software or, or writing something that is uh, only exists in a digital form. Under the current law, you don't have to use what we call the formalities of notice and registration. And those are the, uh, the C with the circle around it that you see oftentimes. Um, along with the name of the creator and the date. You, you certainly may uh, affix notice to your copyrighted work, but you don't have to. Uh, similarly, the Copyright Office will accept registration of copyrighted work. Uh, registration starts, starts at $35 and you fill out a form um, and send, a, uh, send it on to the Copyright Office. But you don't have to register unless you want to sue people. Uh, and the, the, the uh, registration is, is really key in the, in the process of litigation, which probably most of you are not involved with. Um, most universities may defend themselves against lawsuits. They don't spend a lot of time suing people for the most part. Copyright protects a wide variety of media and subjects. So we often think of books as being a copyright, right? journal articles, if we're in academia, uh, music, but, but also copyright protects all sorts of visual work. It protects photography, it protects computer software. It, uh, many, many forms of creative expression are, um, are protected by copyright. But then there are also things that aren't protected by copyright. Um, 
the public domain material is, is one of those things. This is material that is not in copyright, either because it is aged out of copyright, its copyright term has expired. Um, most U.S. government material never is in copyright. Uh, by law, we all have the ability to reproduce and distribute uh, works of the federal government, which is, when you think about it, a very, very cool thing. And, and not all countries uh, run their copyright law like this. It's, it's something that is uh, a wonderful feature of our government and our copyright code. Um, just to note that when I say U.S. government work, I don't mean state government work. Uh, that work falls under a number of different kinds of copyright statuses, all the way from some states saying that all or most of their work is um, in the public domain to some states um, actively copyright again, enforcing copyright on some of their work. And actually, I think the state of Georgia is involved in some litigation around that right now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, before the 76 Copyright Act in this country, work that was published without formalities went into the public domain right away. So depending on the year that uh, a work was created, let's say, well, I'll give you an, an example that I've worked with. Um, a woman who took photographs of uh, during the process of migrant workers organizing in California. They were published in a newsletter um, in the 1950s. Uh, she never affixed notice to any of the work, and it went into the public domain immediately. Uh, lots of lots of examples of things like that. Uh, a lot of the lawsuits from that period um, spend a lot of time worrying about things like what is publication? How wide does it have to be? Widely does it have to be published, and so on? But um, there are also during that period, pre-76, a lot of works were not uh, renewed, and they went into the public domain if their registrations were not renewed. Um, so these are our challenges when you're working with um, using sources to to make new sources, as all of you are doing if you are. Uh, writing scholarly articles, uh, creating textbooks, any of, any of those sorts of things where you need to use material from the past. Um, ideas and facts and useful objects can't be copyrighted at all. Uh, the idea is that we don't want to be have a situation where individuals or companies can control the free flow of ideas, um, the, uh, the dissemination of facts, and things like that. Sometimes also we see something that, that we call thin copyright. So these are often materials where there is a work that perhaps is in the public domain, but it's been augmented with, an with uh, annotations or something like that. In those cases, the body of the work is not in copyright, but the annotations might be. Similar, sometimes, sometimes uh, you'll see work that is, let's say, um, comprised mostly of agricultural statistics, for example, um, with a little bit of commentary um, and uh, narrative along with it. The facts, the agricultural statistics, cannot be copyrighted, but the narrative and the arrangement of the facts might be. So I want to commend to you what I call the incredibly useful public domain chart. Uh, this is a chart that is updated by staff at Cornell, uh, updated yearly um, and more often if, if the law requires it, explaining a lot of the details of the copyright term in the public domain in the U.S. Um, it starts by uh, describing the copyright status for never published, never registered works, and goes through all kinds of permutations. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly helpful chart to, to use if you're dealing especially with mid-century materials and you're not sure whether you've got material that's in copyright or not. Um, one thing you can see uh, high up at, at the start of the incredibly useful chart is that most 
textual works published in the U.S. Um, before 1923 are in the public domain. Uh, one thing to remember is that that magic date isn't the same for all other countries. Some countries have different um, rules about different types of materials. Um, another thing to remember uh, is that uh, sound recordings are an exception to everything I've said so far. Uh, sound recordings before 1972 were not covered by federal copyright law at all. They are covered by a wide variety of uh, state laws that some of them are kind of helpful in, in determining copyright status and some of them are not at all helpful. <laughs> uh, for example, the North Carolina law talks a lot about uh, what will happen to a person who bootlegs a sound recording, but that's really all it covers. Uh, and that's, that's not an un uncommon situation. So what do you get when you have a copyright? We often talk about the rights uh, available to the copyright holder as a bundle of rights, and those rights are reproduction, distribution, publication, uh, public performance, display, making derivative works, which is the making of things like sequels, editions, um, translations, things like that, and the making of digital audio transmissions. Um, what's not on this list, uh, the big one that's not on the list is attribution. So the copyright holder has no legal right to have his or her work attributed to them. Uh, most people want that, most people get it if they can, but it isn't legally required. That is different in Europe, for, for example, and, and in a number of other countries, but is just a feature that, that U.S. law doesn't, doesn't uh, provide for, for the most part. So what happens when a public, copyright-wise, when a public domain work is digitized? Um, only Congress can put material that is in the public domain back into copyright. So if uh, my library digitizes a slave narrative from the 1850s, uh, we cannot claim a new copyright in that work unless we have added material uh, that is recent to it. So if we simply do um, a faithful copy of the original in digital form, no, no new copyright exists. If we somehow provided um, extensive annotations or, or um, illustrations or something like that, then there might well be a copyright in those things that we'd added. Uh, the seminal case on this issue is called Bridgman v. Carell and involved an art library and a firm that made slides of uh, that, uh, excuse me, art museum and a firm that made slides of that museum's public domain artwork and sold them. Uh, the museum claimed a copyright in the work and uh, the slide company successfully defended saying there's no new copyright here. Uh, the court used the term slavish copying, which is kind of one of those colorful legal expressions to, to talk about the exact copies that Corel had made of the public domain work. Um, despite that, some cultural institutions will claim a copyright in public domain work that they've digitized. Um, sometimes they do this because they are looking for attribution um, or want credit for the, the hard work of digitization that they have done. Some are looking to monetize their work and um, feel that that may be the best way to uh, make sure that they can um, sell high-resolution high reproductions or something like that. Um, I don't uh, 
scold people who do this too much because UNC did this a lot in the past. Um, this is an example of one, um, an uh, item that was created in the 1850s. It's a manuscript map. It's definitely in the public domain, but uh, we are saying that we want prior permission um, from the North Carolina collection at UNC if anyone wants to use the, the map for commercial purposes, the image of the map. And legally, we really can't, we can't require that permission. Um, unless, for example, the person who had given us the map had, uh, had gotten some kind of specification like that in the donor agreement. Very unlikely that it happened in this case. Um, we are in the process of trying to clean up some of these erroneous rights statements that we've made in the past. Uh, it's a big, it's a big undertaking for any cultural institution that's done a lot of digitization. So what if you do have a copyright though? Um, what can you do with that copyright besides um, exclude people? Uh, say, I am the rights holder, I have the monopoly on reproduction, and the rest of you can't reproduce this unless I say so. Um, the rights holder can also unpack parts of the bundle that they own. So, for example, um, these, these rights can be given away or licensed separately. Uh, the <clears throat> rights holder might say, you know, I'm going to give this group of people the right of reproduction for this amount of time, but I'm going to keep all the other rights. Uh, the rights holder can say, I'm going to sell the right, sell a license to use certain types of work in a certain type of way, but not other works, other um, types of uses with other people. So um, you don't have to, as the rights holder, have a good reason, in, for the most part, for the um, decisions you make around that. For example, sometimes people seeking permission to use copyrighted work will say, well, the rights holders, it's in the rights holders' best interest to allow me to use this work, so they have to do it. And the answer is very seldom is that true. Uh, the rights holder can have any reason uh, to deny uh, a license or to approve a license. Um, one of the things that is challenging about licensing in a, in a situation where we have such long copyright terms is, as you can imagine, sometimes there is material that is still floating around in the world, an older book, an image, a, a box of photographs, um, and there's a rights holder out there somewhere, and we don't, we don't know who it is. In some cases, we can't find out who it is, and uh, um, we sort of are, are at an impasse. So we are in a situation at this point in our uh, life with copyright where we have a lot of material that maybe potentially could be licensed, but we don't know how to do it because uh, rights holders are either not around anymore or we don't know how to find them. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, getting a license. So a license confers a right on the person who's holding the license. So for example, if I have a driver's license, it's because the government said, uh, I am going to give you the right to drive. Um, rights, licenses don't carry over into other activities. So for example, if I, I have a license to drive a car, that doesn't mean I have a license to be a cosmetologist. Um, in the world of copyright, this means if you have a license to, let's say, reproduce a work for a particular purpose, um, you do not necessarily have a license to use that work for other purposes. Uh, you need to look at the scope of the license that you've been granted. Um, you must have rights in order to grant rights. So for example, uh, in the example I gave earlier of the manuscript map, uh, one of the reasons we can't give permission is that we don't we don't have the rights to do so. Um, Anne. Yes. 
We have a question uh, that I think somebody wants uh, yeah. at the moment. Can someone post the Cornell link about copyright? I think that was probably back a few in your slides. Yeah. I could type that in. Yeah. It's, oh, here, here it is. is. OK, yeah. I will do that. Uh, it's not uh, copyable from. Uh. Yeah, the, uh, I have to say what I do a lot of times if I am disorganized and not finding my bookmarks like I should is type copyright Cornell, uh, public domain, and lo and behold. It, it, oh, yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an, like I said, it's a very, very useful uh, tool. And that, we did have a question about, yeah. um, uh, so this is one that uh, I've seen in some grant projects too. Um, translations of public domain materials. So if you translate a Plato text uh, in the late 20th century, is it still considered public domain or is it under copyright? Um, it's, it's going to depend on if you added new material ah. in part. So uh, you will see people claim a copyright in that material. They may have a copyright to the extent that uh, that creativity is involved. Yeah. Um, and so I think functionally, a lot of times we act as though they have a new copyright, whether they do or not. In in reality, is probably um, going to be a fact by fact inquiry. But but like I said, functionally, a lot of times. Uh, you don't have to get permission to make that translation, but uh, the translator a lot of times will uh, treat that work as, as copyrighted work, and other people will too. Okay, cool. So that's one of those it depends answers. <laughs> but but in general, I uh, I think most people most you know general practice is to treat it as a copyrighted work. Well, I hope uh, that answers your question, Dr. Vo. Just uh, let us know if you have any follow-ups. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry, uh, keep going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, you can grant an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license to a person seeking a license. Um, a full exclusive license acts like a copyright transfer and has to be in writing. Other license uh, grants of other licenses don't have to be, although writing is always good. And um, yeah, I think it's it's very very important as I kind of said before to think about the scope of the license if you're on either side of one of these transactions, either as the person granting the license or the person seeking it. Uh, thinking about what you what you want from the license, as it were, and uh, um, what you are willing to give. Creative Commons licensing. Um, creativecommons.org is the website for, for where you can learn more about this type of license. This is a preemptive licensing scheme that was designed primarily for academic and nonprofit work, and it is used mostly in that world. Uh, there are many types of Creative Commons licenses. I think there are six, six types overall. And they um, allow for varying degrees of um, control and lack of control by the rights holder over the work. Uh, all of them require attribution, however. So no matter what uh, type of license you choose, if, if the rights holder has specified a Creative Commons license, they're going to want attribution. And I think you, you are using these licenses extensively in some of the affordable learning work you're doing. Um, and by that kind of work is exactly where Creative Commons licensing can be so helpful to people. I also wanted to um, say a little bit about exceptions in the Copyright Code. That's not the, the thrust of this talk, but uh, it, it, it is a concept that is often sort of um, gets melded with the idea of a license in people's minds. Um, the, the function of exceptions to the rights holder's exclusive rights is to have a balance between the creator and the consumer. You've got the rights holder's monopoly and you've got the First Amendment. Uh, you've got the need and uh, 
I want to say the health, the, for, the, for the welfare of society, uh, sometimes people need to copy portions of work for criticism, commentary, etc., uh, news reporting parody. And so there is felt to be a, a place for exceptions in the copyright code. Um, the difference between a license and an exception is that, uh, one, the license is granted by the rights holder, the exception is granted by the law. Um, so it, with an exception, the work is in copyright, but the law still allows some sorts of uses. Uh, fair use is the exception that probably we at academia use the most often. Uh, fair use is not a right statement. It may be the exception that a person has exercised in order to use a portion of a copyrighted work. But it is in itself a, uh, an expression of a license that's been granted by a rights holder, or nor does it say anything about the copyright status of the work except that it's in copyright or the, the uh, person exercises the exception thinks it's in copyright. So one thing that we see a lot when we're navigating the world of creating open educational resources is uh, we're look, often looking for picture, pictures to enliven text. And one thing that comes up a lot on sites like uh, Wikimedia Commons and Flickr and, and sites that have a lot of openly licensed material is that sometimes you have a public domain work that an individual has um, claimed as, a cop in cop as being in copyright. So for example, this is a photograph of a cave painting in Spain. The, uh, the Wikimedia user Enric took the picture. He has licensed it with a CC by SA license. Okay, um, does he have a copyright in his photograph? And the answer, again, you'll not be surprised to hear, is maybe. Uh, he does have a copyright to the extent he added new creativity to the photograph he had. But he obviously has no, uh, he cannot assert a copyright over the uh, cave painting itself, which is thousands and thousands of years old, and he didn't do it. Um, a lot of times with these sorts of situations, I sort of try to split the difference um, by perhaps using the license and, and uh, attributing it to the, the person who made the photograph, but then also adding some, some other attribution statement that says this is from a cave in Spain and we think it was done, you know, in 10,000 BCE or whatever the situation is. Um, I think with this kind of material, the really the the best you can do is to sort of try to decide a policy for dealing with the various um, claims of attribution and accuracy that you're that you're faced with in a situation like that. Um, some best practices to consider. Uh, this comes from my own work with. Uh, helping folks deal with third party material in OERs. Um, think about the difference between a right statements and licenses uh, when you're applying um, different types of uh, statements to work. Um, often licenses give more information than right statements. Uh, so if, if both might apply, sometimes the license is the thing that you might want to emphasize in your attribution because it does tell more about how how a person could reuse the work. Um, attribution is almost always appreciated, including institutional attribution. So for example, um, in this picture of the cave, uh, the, the cave painter, of course, is beyond caring about attribution. But if there is a cultural institution that protects that painting and, uh, and so on, 
those sorts of institutions often would love to have a credit to. And, and this is something certainly I do in my work here at UNC a lot. So someone uh, will write to us and say, I want permission to use a map from, that was made in 1580. And I write back and say, no permission needed from us. It's in the public domain. But we would sure love it if you added a cut line that said, uh, courtesy of, the, of UNC Chapel Hill. They don't have to legally, but it, it's um, something we ask for, and mostly people are very glad to do it. Um, think about the difference between the digitizer and the creator, which is what I was doing in that example I just gave. Uh, we're not the creator, but we are the digitizer. We love attribution as a digitizer but we can't demand it. Um, another thing that I think can be helpful a lot of times if you are, say, using a block of text and you want to include a URL for where you found the text to link to, um, I say original, I mean a digitization of the original on, on a stable platform. So, for example, um, if uh, I'm working with a textbook that is using a, an excerpt from a book published in 1920. If I can find a digitized copy on the Haughty Trust website or the Internet Archive or on another platform that has a very clear mandate for preservation, um, that is often helpful because those links are less likely to, to go bad on you and that material is likely to be at that link the next time you go looking for it. Um, these next slides I'm just mentioning so that because there's such incredibly useful information there. Um, the Creative Commons Wiki has FAQs that cover all kinds of situations that come up for people um, about um, how do I best attribute the work, um, what what do I do I use that little button that uh, you see a lot of times with a Creative Commons license. Um, it go, they go into excellent detail, uh, the kind of thing you don't want to, you know, read right before bedtime, but unless you just want to go to sleep. But when you need the information, it's super great to have it in that kind of format. Um, similarly, uh, the Creative Commons Wiki has a whole section on marking third-party content, uh, which talks about some of the things I just discussed, how to uh, uh, think about what material is, um, who is the rights holder for, for material, and how to express that best when you're um, using that material in another work. Uh, and I think that in my monologue, are there any questions? Hmm, well, I was, that link I, didn't work. Yeah, I was trying oh, to speed type, so I bet I didn't do something right. Can you can you go back to that slide? Yeah. Let's try this out again. This one? Yep. Okay. And in the meantime, feel free to ask any questions, yes, absolutely. everybody. I'd also just be interested in learning more about what um, uh, kinds of projects you all are working on. Yes, if anybody has any questions um, linked to what they're using in class, this would be a great time to ask. You know, I think I got everything right on there. All right, let's try this again. That works. Okay, great. All right, so what I'm okay. going to do is return back um, and take the presenter role so I can just okay. move.
Oh, we have a question. We do. Uh, when I create a particular tool for a class that I put online, should I put some kind of statement on it? Um, you can. So if you can uh, add notice if you'd like to. Uh, if you, if if that fits with what you're doing institutionally, you could add a Creative Commons license if you wanted to. Um, you don't have to. Your copyright. Uh, exists at the moment of fixation, as they say, whether or not you put a, uh, a statement of, of copyright notice on the material, but it, if you would like for it to be there, it doesn't hurt. Sometimes I tell people who are, say, um, making material available on a website and they, they are just kind of worried that somebody's going to take it. They're not, you know, they're not worried enough to put it behind a paywall or something. Um, I say, well, you can always affix notice, and it just tells people, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, um, uh, to some degree, enforcing my copyright. Yeah, and I've uh, linked the uh, Share Your Work page from Creative Commons. They have a, a new mm -hmm. um, license selector in there. So if you want to put a statement on there um, saying, you know, that you have the right to use this so long as you attribute it to me, you may just be able to do that through a Creative Commons mm -hmm. license, and that's what uh, Creative Commons makes so easy for sure. Right, and it's. Yeah, and and it makes a lot of sense a lot for a lot of academic material. Oh, um, we've got a Q and A uh, question. I hardly ever use the Q and A panel, but I see it here um, from Elizabeth Wallace. Um, she's interested in Creative Commons licensing. She's a grant recipient, and she will be adapting an OER. Oh, okay, so that's more of a, a statement. But thank you oh, okay. very much. Yes, thanks. Oh. Um, so we have a follow-up question from Rod McRae. Yeah. Uh, what if that tool is somewhat derivative from someone else's work? Um, so Rod, if you want to uh, specify what that work is, if it's like completely copyright protected or if it's also Creative Commons licensed or public domain, that would be also helpful here. Um, can I do so through, through audio? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so let's say I'm pulling, um, I, I deal with uh, freshman comp mostly, so if I'm de uh, using some sort of mnemonic um, for uh, helping the students write an essay, it's come from somebody else's material which has no particular uh, statement or copyright or something on it, but it may have come from another university's website. Um, if I post that for my students on my website, uh, do I need to provide some sort of um, statement or linking to, to the original one um, if I leave it whole or if I change it somewhat for my own purposes? Um, either way, it probably wouldn't hurt to attribute it. Um, I, I would say if you're going to use it whole um, and you, you might, you would definitely want to attribute it, maybe even ask permission. Okay. Um, the, if you modify it, I think it's going to depend on the amount of modification. The underlying idea of using an aid for memory is can't be copyrighted, but the more that the um, the particular way that I the more you use the particular way the idea is communicated, um, the closer you get to the original, and the more likely it is that you'll want to um, seek permission. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, um, also we get some questions like this, and if you're using the whole work and you're not changing it and you're able to just link out, that link by itself is not infringing exactly. on Exactly, that's a good copyright. point to, to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, linking doesn't implicate copyright at all in the U.S. Yeah. And it is, it is somewhat tough for sustainability purposes sometimes, but it is an easy way, at least through the U.S. I remember, yeah, Europe is starting to deal with this in different ways. Uh, there was something coming up that... Yeah, there have been some, some, um, some lawsuits that indicate that there may be some situations where linking is, could be considered infringement in Europe. I'm still not real clear on how, 
how they're going to enforce that really <laughs> uh it uh but uh yeah i'm not i'm not sure where that's going to go completely yet i don't think they know either yeah uh, we have a question from Caroline Hopkinson. I had a question from an instructor who wished to play music during a class session, only heard by the class, or perhaps an online class. Is this fair use? Um, so performance uh, or display, public performance or display, face-to-face -face in a classroom is covered by a very specific, uh, well-established copyright exception. So playing music in the class, is a okay uh, doing so online um, I think you're going to need to be looking at uh, the extent to which it's it um, it being the the public are not really public performance the performance is um, available only to the class uh, the other thing I would look at very carefully if you're doing a fair use analysis for this is uh, what is the pedagogical Need here, and uh, is this the be you know is this the only best way or only or best way to fulfill it, um, and are you using only the part or is the instructor using only the part that's necessary in order to fulfill that pedagogical need? So I think the clo more closely you can tie the the playing of the music to what's happening in the classroom, the more successful you, you are in doing a, a good fair use analysis in this case. Yeah, and there should be someone on your campus that uh, deals with Teach Act ideas when it comes to online. Um, for example, I was at Valdosta State. Um, our media services department dealt with uh, very specific uh, video online things that dealt with the Teach Act and hopefully there would be somebody who's an expert on that. Yeah, and and uh, I didn't mention the Teach Act <laughs> because mm. it is it is a complicated analysis. Oh yeah. Um but uh yes, if you can if you, the use fits within the scope of the Teach Act which is intended to help with distance learning situations like this. Um and sometimes it actually does and sometimes it doesn't. But if it does mm -hmm. fit within the scope of the Teach Act, you are on very firm legal ground too. Uh, which is sometimes comforting. Yeah. And, yeah. And if you want to, you know, if you don't have anyone on campus and you want to talk about the Teach Act a little bit more offline, I'd be glad to do so. Yeah, that's that's one of those very, very, very specific things. I've also linked to the uh, University System of Georgia's guide to the Teach Act, uh, just in mm -hmm. case anyone's interested, because that's our our system's uh, line on that. Um, we have another question from Dr. Vo. If we are creating a language book exercise using news, would it be fair use? For example, if we create reading comprehension questions out of the news, publish the news and the comprehension questions in a book. Okay, so um, if the and, the, and so you would publish the news excerpts in the book? Uh huh. They're saying yes, the news excerpt. Okay. Yeah. You um, at the point where they published in a book, you might well need to seek permission. Um, your publisher will probably have some general, or, or is this something that you're publishing through the ALG program? Well, they would be either um, publishing it and making it available yeah. to us. Um, but yeah, if you're going to put a Creative Commons license on something like this, then obviously you'd need to consider it. Yeah, yeah, I think you would need to get permission if if you're going to um, publish it in an open resource and and even if it's in a conventional textbook, yes. Um, that is the sort of thing that uh, where you're, you're probably just flat out going to get, need to get permission. Mm -hmm. Um, and look at the terms of use on the site where you got the material and talk to whomever they say you talk to about permissions. Mm -hmm. Yep, it can get very, very complicated. Oh, thank it you. It does, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, for example, um, the University of North Georgia Press, which deals with our big open textbooks, 
um, they have somebody on staff who just looks at all of the copyright clearance stuff and uh, make sure that if they have any licensing agreements that they need to do, that those get done, and then cite, uh, citing slash attributing everything else. What if old news before 1922? Well, that would usually be the public domain, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 23, before 23. Yes. So you could use 1922 news as well. Uh -huh. Yes. And you know, a lot of newspapers didn't register their copyrights. Um, but the process of going through and figuring that out can be um, thorny sometimes. I think uh, we can get tripped up sometimes if we go to a uh, uh, copyright session and then we hear that news itself is not protected by copyright. That's a little bit different than a published article in the New York right. Times. Right, yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the 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 facts of news are are not copyrightable, but the the actual article that's been written uh, usually is. Mm -hmm. I think we've got everybody. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Well, thank you very much for all the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. And thank you uh, to Anne for doing this presentation yeah. and answering our questions. I think this was extremely informative especially to people who are dealing with these right at the moment as we're hearing. Right, so. exactly, yeah. And if you, you know, want to talk later about anything, feel free. Uh, I'm easy to find. Uh, we have a post-event survey, and I'm going to link you to the longer link for it, um, if I can get it, because this is a pretty long link either way. Uh, so, part of my typing for a second here. There it is. Going to the form, the send form, copying the form. All right. So, first of all, um, please fill out this survey if you can. Uh, this will help us improve our webinars in the future. Um, we've got a question of whether or not the PowerPoint presentation will be available. Um, if it's okay, uh, Anne, if you send yep. that to me, I, I can make it. I will send it to you, yes. Uh, we are going to be archiving this session on the Training and Development page for Affordable Learning Georgia, and we will put the slides there, too. Thank you, thank you all of you, for, for attending. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Anne. Goodbye. Bye-bye.